Welcome once again. How do you handle the grim news of inequality, corruption, poverty, dysfunction, and buffoonery that washes over us every day? Well, you can tune out and ignore it, pretend it will go away until it's too late, or you can look around, find kindred spirits, and throw your energies into the fight for justice. That's exactly the summons we've heard from people at this table who have refused to give in to the litany of woe. Listen again to some of their voices. We need a movement of truth-tellers. The kind of progressive grassroots movement. A social movement that they can engage in that's not the politics of hatred, that's not the politics of fear, but the politics of hope. There's two ways to approach history. You, you sit in your armchair and you watch it on the news and you, ret and you return to your PlayStation, or you get out in the streets and you make it. They can push the rest of us to wake up and do something about this. People. Uh, need to rise up and say, I'm sick of this. Seeing themselves as a huge movement to transform the nation. The change that we want comes from below. It comes from a movement. That the American people can and will find ways to push for the kinds of changes that can get us out of this dilemma. I want to see that change, and it's going to take people here in this country to be able to make that happen. To that chorus, let us now add the witness of Marshall Gans. He's an American maestro of organizing who himself has never given in to despair or given over to fear. How, how, how can change ever happen if the powerful always win? There are conditions under which, turns out David can sometimes win. At Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, Marshall Gans teaches the next generation of organizers, students from all over the world. He tells them, when in doubt, just remember the story in the Bible of little David and his slingshot. What did you take from the classic story of David and Goliath? How does it begin? How does the whole thing, when does, when does the action begin? No. Goliath is marching out and repeatedly uh, challenging the Israelites, and no one comes out to challenge him. Right. And so that's just going on day after day. So then what, when does the action shift? When David shows up to bring the food to his brothers and hears this and says, why does no one do anything to respond to this? In other words, the first thing that happens here is injustice, need to act, commit, and then the action begins. Until that point, nothing's really happening. When the king says, here, take my, take my helmet, take my shield, take my armor. What does David do? Take my sword? Yeah. He puts, him puts it on. Right? Puts them on. Yeah. See, David doesn't have it all figured out. That's the point. He's in action here. He doesn't have it all figured out. King says, oh, you're going to fight power? Here, you need weaponry to fight power. David actually takes them, he puts them on, and then what happens? He can't, can't move. They're too heavy, literally. He can't move. That's when he has his moment of insight. He looks down at his feet, and he sees these five smooth stones there. He says, wait a second. I'm not a soldier, I'm a shepherd. And that's him when he says, as a shepherd, I knew how to protect my flock from the wolf and the bear. And it wasn't with the sword, it wasn't with the shield, it was with the stone, the sling. Maybe Goliath's just another wolf, just another bear. Hey, what's Goliath's reaction? Laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's very good. That's very good. That's good, good. That's, how, that's how I imagine it might. Ho, 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 yeah, this is. Am I a dog? You send a boy with a stick. And in the middle of the third, ho, <laughs> stone in the forehead into Goliath and not a story about nonviolence. Smiting Goliath might as well be Marshall Gans's job description. It began in Mississippi's Freedom Summer of 1964 when his fury against injustice pulled him out of Harvard and into the struggle for civil rights. From there, he signed on with the legendary Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers and for 16 years, struggled to unionize the men and women in the fields of California who toiled endless hours and mounting days picking crops for next to nothing. Three decades after Marshall Gans had dropped out of Harvard, he went back to finish his degree and earn a doctorate. A few years later, he was asked to become the architect behind the Obama campaign's skillful organizing of students and volunteers. Today, Marshall Gans is a founder of the Leading Change Network. That's a global community of organizers, educators, and researchers mobilizing for democracy. You'll find more of his experience and philosophy in this book, Why David Sometimes Wins. Marshall Gans, it's good to meet you. It's good to meet you, Bill.
stories have been a powerful part of your life. Where did that come from? Why stories? First of all, I grew up in, in stories. My father was a rabbi. And I grew up with the Exodus story as a child, and I was always puzzled by the fact that, you know, they said at a certain point, you were slaves in Egypt. I'd never been a slave or been to Egypt. They said to the children, and, and, but then I came to realize that what it meant was the story really wasn't the property of one people, time, or place. And then out to the farm workers. And we're in, we're in uh, the, the, the religious narrative. I mean, I, one of my first assignments in the farm workers was to organize a march from Delano to Sacramento. Uh, but it wasn't a march, it was a peregrinacion, it was a pilgrimage, it was at Lent. It reached Sacramento on Easter Sunday. It was like an enactment of the redemptive narrative of Easter but it was built into the movement that we were building. So in my experience in organizing, it was also all within narrative. And so we kind of knew that narrative stories mattered and they mattered to the heart and it weren't the whole story, they, the whole story, so to speak. They, strategy mattered, structure mattered, but narrative mattered, the motivation, the courage. Yeah, until I read your book about Chavez and the Strikers, I didn't know how much their own efforts revolved around stories. But mm. then when I read your book, mm. I realized how the stories that they told mm. and the stories that they inherited mm -hmm. added up to a story they wanted to leave for their children. Oh yeah, sure. But th I mean, that's one of the things that distinguishes movements from like interest groups. Movements have narratives. They tell stories because they are, they are not just about rearranging economics and politics, they also rearrange meaning. And, and they're not just about redistributing the goods, they're about figuring out what is good. So they have this cultural piece of work that movements are doing along with the economic and the political, not in lieu of it. And, and, I, and, and I think it's particularly important because doing that kind of work that movements do requires risk taking, uncertainty, going up against the odds, and that takes a lot of hope. And, and so where do you go for hopefulness? Where do you go for courage? Where do you go? You go to those moral resources that are found within narratives and within identity work and within all faith traditions, cultural traditions. You know, Campbell told me that that was his great, the great appeal to him of, of Carl Jung, that Jung wrapped his psychology into the stories of what had actually happened yes. in his life yes. and, and in the lives of the people sitting in front of him. Yeah. And if he could get somebody yeah. into a story, he knew that person would discover yeah. who he was more likely than if he dealt with just abstract ideas. Boy, it is so true. It's the particular. See, we often think we associate understanding with abstraction. It's mm. just the opposite. Yeah, that's right. The particular then becomes the portal on the transcendent because it's through the particular experience that I'm able then to communicate the emotional content of the value that is moving me. You know, my father was a uh, chaplain in the, in the American Army. We lived in Germany uh, after the war for three years. And my fifth birthday party was, uh, what he worked a lot with what were called DPs, um, uh, displaced, displaced persons. persons. Well, my fifth birthday party was in a camp of, uh, a DP camp of all children. And my mother um, thought that I should give presents rather than get them. Well, I didn't quite get that. And I actually thought it was kind of cool that there were no parents. And so later I realized why there were no parents. And so it was, it was sort of a moment and then a deeper understanding of that moment mm -hmm. later that sort of was a kind of sobering experience and, and helped me understand the emotional work that, star that stories do. How so? It helped me understand that, that, that dealing, with, dealing with fear is probably the, the, the central moral question we have to deal with. And I, by moral, I mean, if you think, if you think of, of moral questions as not being about principles, but more what Hume called moral sentiment. In other words, how do I, how do I live with empathy as opposed to alienation? How do I live with a sense of my own value as opposed to a, a feeling of deficiency? How do I live in a spirit of hope instead of f fear? It's how to be in the world, right? How to, how to be in the world 
and capable of moral engagement with other human beings. It, it's sort of how I think of it. Maimonides, the, 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 the 12th century Jewish philosopher, defined hope as uh, said, belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. Now, let me say that again. That to be a realist is to recognize that the world is not a domain in which the probable always happens. I mean, Goliath is more likely to win. But you know what? Sometimes David does, you know? Was there a time you had to do that? You had to suspend disbelief and, 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 and see that the inevitable was not a necessity, that it was a probability? <laughs> oh boy, I, you know, uh, well, first of all, thinking I could get into Harvard in the first place from Bakersfield, uh, leaving Harvard to go work in Mississippi. And you, you left before you'd finished your studies. Yeah, I had a year to go. I, 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 but see, when I left, it was to just go for the summer project. But I found a calling there. Marshall, what are your motives for going down to Mississippi this summer? Um, reading the papers all last year, uh, talking with people and hearing about what was happening in Mississippi and in the South, shooting of Medgar Evers and, and other events, uh, like that, generate such a feeling of, of outrage and injustice that you feel you must act. I found this thing called organizing, which I had never really understood or heard of. And it wasn't about charity. It wasn't about, you know, help, helping. It was about, it was about justice. It, it was about working with other people in a way that respected and enhanced their agency and my own at the same time. How did you learn that? through being part of it, our initial project. So we were trying to claim voting rights because uh, African Americans, uh, of course, didn't have the right to vote, uh, in, in uh, any practical right to vote in Mississippi, Alabama, much of Georgia, and so forth in those states at that time. The work was to uh, build a parallel organization called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that was because the, the regular Democratic Party excluded blacks. So our idea was we were going to build a parallel one choose a delegation, go to the Atlantic City Democratic Convention 1964, challenge the racist Democrats, and replace them with our Democrats, and that was going to be a blow for the civil rights movement. So the work was going to people's houses, black people, talking with them, registering the Freedom Democratic Party, have a house meeting, come to a caucus, get elected, working with people to, to find courage, to find solidarity, to find a sense of hopefulness, to stand up to pretty scary stuff. I mean, you know, three of our group were killed before we even left Oxford, Ohio. That was Goodwin, Cheney, and Schreiner. And so it was, I've often thought about that book by Paul Tillich, Love, Power, and Justice. Love, Power, and Justice. And where, where he argues that power without love can never be just, but similarly, love that doesn't take power seriously can never achieve justice. And that was, I think, what I learned. You've said that when you tell a story, the story becomes three stories. <laughs> yes. Well, when we do public, so public narrative is, is like a leadership skill of moving people to public action. So there's a story of self, which is using narrative to communicate why I've been called. So I tell a story that can communicate the values that move me. A story of us is using narrative to create a sense of the values we share as a community. And then the story of now is do they experience the challenge to those values that requires action now? So it's sort of three, three pieces. So that's what Martin Luther King meant when he talked about the urgency of now at Riverside Church. That's exactly right. And you'll see in that talk his calling and then he reminds us of what we're called to as African Americans, as white Americans, and as Americans. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in this unfolding conundrum of life and history that is such a thing as being too late. And if we will only make the right choice, we will be able to transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of peace if we will make the right choice 
we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. If we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. It's so amazing the way he's able to, to speak the, lang the Christian language, but in a way that's inclusive and not exclusive. It's really extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And, uh, uh, and, then, and then because we share those values, guess what, folks? We face the fierce urgency of a now that requires action. That's, that's what public narrative is. Is it true that um, the slogan for Cesar Chavez and his farm workers was, "See"? Si Se puede. Si se puede, yeah. Which translated literally into Obama's Yes, yes we, we can. Oh, you betcha. Is that right? Well, si se puede came in Arizona, 1972. Arizona had a governor, uh, Jack Williams, that passed a law that denied farm workers the right to organize, boycott, strike. It was a terrible law. And so we had to figure out were we going to challenge it or not. And so we all went to Arizona to challenge it. We got there and uh, been out talking to people, and Dolores Huerta actually came back. We were meeting in a hotel motel room. She said, I've been talking to all these everywhere, and everywhere I go, people say, no se puede, no se puede, no se puede. She means, ah, oh, you can't do it, you can't do it. You know, it's just, you know, and, and we, we, gotta, we gotta answer that. We gotta say, si se puede. And so that became the slogan of that campaign, was si se puede, yes, it can be done. And that then became a farm worker movement slogan, si se puede. So in New Hampshire, when Obama lost that night, and there were a lot of that talk going on around. Generations of Americans have responded with a simple creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Then he comes out, yes, yes we, we can. can. Well, that's he said. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. That was a great moment. That was what sort of raised such hopes yeah, did, about his presidency. <laughs> did people count too much on his charisma and didn't assess his inexperience sufficiently? Oh, in retrospect, you know, probably so. You know, but I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think there's plenty of responsibility to go around. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, I think there was too much readiness to just leave it up to Obama, and uh, I think that uh, those of us who wanted to do more about economic justice and immigration and climate change, needed to do more. We had to be contentious. That's how it works. It's like this idea that contentiousness is somehow alien to democracy oh, yeah. and that consensus is somehow what democracy is about and that polarization is bad. Paralysis is bad. But, you know, it's like Saul Alinsky said, Organizers have to be well-integrated schizoids because you have to polarize to mobilize and depolarize to settle. But without polarizing, you're never going to mobilize anything. And yeah, then there's a time to negotiate. And I think we're really screwed up on that uh, right now. Oh, yeah, there's, it's always been struggle and conflict and winners and losers that move us forward that's, or backward. That's the heart of demo democracy is a, form, is a system of contention. I mean, of constructive contention when it works. What did the farm workers want? Do you remember in the farm workers story, those that read that one? Do you remember in this context, in this moment, what they wanted? Is there recognition for UFW? Yeah, it was recognition, and, and it wound up being recognition from a particular employer, Shenley Industries, a big liquor company in, in Delano. A union recognition means a contract signed between the workers and the union specifying wages, hours, working conditions, and all the rest. Very, very concrete objective, right? But that was like the focus of their efforts so that they could then move toward the bigger goals of, of broader justice and, and all the rest of it. And so the whole point about outcomes is specifying them clearly enough that you can actually focus in and commit to making it happen or not. And, and I think a lot of projects are sort of struggling with that right now, is how to specify the place between you know, justice out there, goodness in the world, and like my next meeting. Suppose one of those students said to you, uh, Professor Gans, I know that the farm workers were outfinanced and outmanned, and I know they were opposed by business owners and other labor leaders spurned them, yet you say that they worked out a successful 
grassroots strategy to organized, illiterate grape pickers. Is there any lesson in that? The lesson would be to look at how it was they figured out how to do it. See, it's sort of like you don't copy that, but you sort of look at the depth of motivation they brought to it, the creativity. How did they figure out their strategy? How did they understand power? What did they understand about it? How did they continue to renew their spirit that they were able to keep moving forward? How did they? Well, there was a lot of this heartworking, a lot of the narrative, the storytelling, a lot of the celebratory, a lot of the nurturing of the heart. I mean, you know, it took us five years to run a great boycott, and we had to reinvent that thing every year. And every year you're going back in and saying, okay, we got to start again. But, but you find in each other, in the solidarity, in, in the myths, if you wish, that, that feed you the capacity to keep going. I remember what you wrote once that you had learned in Mississippi uh, during the summer of 1964. You said all the inequalities between blacks and whites were driven by a deeper mm -hmm. inequality, mm -hmm. the inequality of power. That seems to me the fundamental reality of American life today. Yeah, I think the political inequality and the economic inequality and a kind of cultural inequality that sort of all reinforce one another is an enormous problem. Obviously, I mean, that's, that's sort of what we're trying to deal with. And so the question, and, and in some ways, you could sort of think that liberal democracy is based on a deal, that, that inequality in economic resources can be balanced by equality in political resources. In other words, that equal voice can somehow balance unequal wealth. Well, we're sort of way beyond that. One man, one vote, one person, one vote has been, has, has been overwhelmed by $100,000 and a million dollars. And it's not even just the money. If you live in a swing state, your vote counts so much more than if you live in New York or Illinois or California when it comes to electing a president. If you live in a swing district when it comes to electing a member of Congress, your vote counts. If you live in a district that's been gerrymandered so it's all Democrats or all Republicans, your vote does not count. So when you really look at whose votes count, it's a very, very small proportion. So we have some deep structural flaws that go all the way back to the beginning that aren't, they don't, it's not about us as a people or our culture, our beliefs. We're operating within a, in a set of political institutions that distort and actually warp the, our capacity to express our beliefs. Maybe what we really need is an equal voice amendment to guarantee that each vote actually had equal weight. That'd be pretty radical. And if we actually designed a system that did that, now, you know, would we get something like that tomorrow? No, probably not. But, but I guess my point is that, that there, there are a lot of sources of energy and change in the country, not to mention the world. A lot of it is generationally driven. It's in places that may be unexpected. Let me come closer to where you and I are today. Occupy Wall Street mm. did pull economic inequality out of the closet and put it at the breakfast table, the lunch table, the dinner mm -hmm. table, mm -hmm. and the political round tables on Sunday. But it didn't hang around to fight for it. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, I think, I think Occupy made a great contribution in that it did what you just said. It, it took economic inequality, economic justice, and made it legitimate. But they got stuck. I mean, they got stuck on a tactic without a strategy that went beyond a tactic. And, you know, one tactic doesn't build a movement. It takes... It takes venues in which people can strategize about how to move the ball forward. You know, I mentioned at the beginning sort of these three elements of story, strategy, and structure that you sort of need to, to build a movement, an organization. You gotta have your, the, the narrative is the why we're doing it. And then the strategy is how we're doing it, not just one tactic, but how, what's our theory of change? What's, what's our theory of, of how we're gonna use our resources to influence those sources of power? And then, how are we, what's our structure through which we're figuring all this stuff out and working at it? And so they had problems there. You know, people confuse structure with oppression. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and Joe Freeman wrote a great piece. Uh, this uh, the, f the feminist, the feminist sociologist, called "The Tyranny of Structurelessness," and and I have all my students read it, where she argues, you think structurelessness, just you're kidding yourself. Any time a group of people get together, they're going to create a structure. The difference is whether it's visible or invisible, whether it's accountable or not, and whether it's it's open and above board and or whether it's all factionalized and, and personalistic. And so you choose what you want. And I think it's really honest. And so the rejection of structure is a sort of rejection of taking responsibility for self-governance. So you talk about the power of story, and for the last 40 years, the story of the free market has been the triumphant story in American culture. It really is, you know, and, 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 and it, it is a it's powerful because it has a moral dimension and it has uh, a, a political dimension and it has an economic dimension. It's sort of like that the market means we're all free to make our own choices, so isn't that great because we want to be free? And it's all about choices. And politically, well, it's all based on people making their choices, and so that's democratic. And economically, well, we all know it's efficient, right? Because that's how markets work. It's, and, and the problem is every one of those claims is fundamentally flawed and fundamentally an act of faith. I mean, Harvey Cox wrote this thing about the market as God. And, and, but the, the big question is where's the missing alternative counter to that? And I think that is an enormous intellectual challenge for our time right now. Where's that alternative? We need a new story. We need a new story, we, but it's also a new way of, of describing our economic challenges and our political challenges that emphasizes not this idea of what each individual competes with each other individual as the answer, but the ways in which we cooperate and collaborate with one another as the answer. You know, Albert Hirschman, the, the development economist, wrote this book a number of years ago, I'm sure you know about exit voice and loyalty. Right. And sort of the idea was, okay, so you got an institution and it's screwing up, and so one way to fix it is to exercise voice. The other way is you can exit. The market solutions are all exit solutions. Explain it. Well, so you don't like the way the schools work? Exit. Make your own over here, and that way you exercise choice. You don't like the way public health works? Exit over here. Make your own. Now, the only problem is you can only exit and make your own if you got the money to do it. Right. And so the result is that you create these parallel systems of elite systems that, are frag you know, that fragment the whole. The public gets poorer and poorer and poorer, and you create all these little isolated golden ghettos all around a privilege. And the focus is on how do we find market solutions, market solutions, yeah. market, when we should be saying, how do we find more effective ways to exercise voice? How can we have more, de more effective public deliberation? How can we bring more people into the process? How can we create the venues where people can actually learn and deliberate with one another? Can you take this one step further or beyond government over to the leadership of, of other institutions, business leaders, mm. educational leaders? Mm. I mean, how do, how do we write a narrative that includes them in this new story of collaboration, cooperation? You know, uh, Carl Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, written in 1941, sort of nailed it when he said, if you have a good that can, that where price captures value, you can marketize it. And where price does not capture value, you cannot marketize it. And he was talking about labor and land when he was writing in 1941. And he was trying to explain the, 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 the problem of the open market system after World War I that had wiped out all sorts of social structures that cleared the way for the rise of fascism in Europe. I mean, this was the context he was writing in. He was saying so the open market system was allowed to be a solvent that ground everything down yeah. because it, it, it doesn't respect values other than price values. Now, how do you put a price on education, really? How do you put a price on health, really? How do you put a price on art, really? Now, when we price these things, we undermine their value. And so that's why we need churches. That's why we need schools whose value isn't based on pricing. It's based on a different set of understanding and the resources that it generates doesn't depend on pricing. So I don't know. There's potentials out there. But I think somehow we need to get this into the, we need to get into this debate. We need to get into this argument and have it be about something really sub substantive 
and not get drawn into these, oh, we're too polarized or something. We need to be more polarized, but polarized around the right things. Is there any kind of organizing like that going on? There's a lot of organizing going I, I'm privileged to get to see it because I work with young people. Within the immigrant right. world, the dreamers have done some great stuff. I mean, they do the organizing, the house meetings, the one-on-ones, all that good old organizing stuff. You know, the crew of young organizers that came out of the Dean campaign in 2003 in New Howard Hampshire. Howard Dean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2003-04, and that crowd that have, you know, percolated through Obama and all that in a variety of different ways, but they brought sound organizing techniques into electoral politics in a way that had disappeared. It had all been marketing. It was all marketing. And not that marketing's not there now in a big way, but the confusion between marketing and movement building is really a big one. I think that's one of the things the environmental groups really, really missed the boat on. I think they thought that they could market their way to legislation. What I mean is that through polling and advertising, they could make what the changes they wanted palatable to enough of the people that they could in that way create enough of a ground that they would get the legislation. That's a marketing proposition. Movement building is you know that you don't have a majority. What you gotta do is build enough of a constituency that you can develop the power you need in order to achieve what you want. And so what you're doing is engaging people who engage other people who engage other people and you build a movement that way. Looking back on your life, is there a, a core to it? Is there a common denominator? <laughs> there were th three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, uh, Rabbi Hillel, when, when asked, how do, we, how do we understand what we are to do in the world? And, and he responded with three questions. The first one is to ask yourself, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? It's not a selfish question, but it is a self-regarding question, sort of saying, ask yourself what you're about, what, what, what you value, what, what you have to contribute. What. But then the second question is, um, if I'm for myself alone, what am I? Which is, it's, to even be a who and not a what is to recognize that we are in the world in relationship with others and that our capacity to realize our own objectives is inextricably wrapped up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. And finally, um, if not now, when? The time for action is always now because it's often only through action that we can learn what we need to learn in order to be able to act effectively in the ways that we intend. And the fact that they're questions is also really important to me because it suggests that this work, this work of organizing leadership is not about knowing, it's about learning. And it's about asking and it's about understanding that it is about dealing with the uncertain, it is about probing the unknown, it's not about control. Uh, it's, it, it's, about, it's about learning through purposeful experience. And so that's kind of, I think, what I've tried to, as I look back, what I've tried to learn, to teach, to do, to practice, is how to be that kind of a learner and teacher. Marshall Gans, I look forward to the next chapter of the story. Thank <laughs> you for sharing your time and ideas with me. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much.